conservative new media viewers, Jeremy Lin, fans around the world, LA Lakers fans around the world. What's up? It's me, PFE, Paul F. Villarreal, the NBA expert. We're here to discuss last night's Lakers 100 to 97 victory over the Utah Jazz in Salt Lake City, Utah. Woo! Excellent win. Uh, hopefully the players didn't celebrate too much so that Byron and, and Kobe won't be too upset. But uh, turning to uh, more serious stuff, this was a very good win. And the reason why the Lakers won was because they came back in the fourth quarter. They were able to score 12 more points than the Jazz did in the fourth quarter. So it was a, it was a good, gritty comeback win for a team that's – Look, there's still a long way for them to go, but they are starting to find their way a, a little bit more. Now, uh, I want to talk about what was going on leading up to the game quickly, and I also want to talk about my own circumstances uh, as well. Let me lead with that. There is a chance <clears throat> that for the remainder of the 2014-2015 season games, and now there's, what, 26 games left, I may have to do the videos the day after the game. Just because as different of you who watch these videos, you know, I have uh, somebody that lives beside me with a small child. And I was talking with that person yesterday. And uh, that just might work out better. So we'll see. I do not expect that to be this circumstance for me next season. And look, if... If something really great happens or something really big happens, uh, I'll probably make the video straight away after. Uh, I'm not sure. We'll just have to see. I'm not even clear how I'm going to proceed with that, but that's something that I might have to do for the remainder of this 2014-15 season. So we'll just play it by ear, and I'll let you guys know. Uh, also, I'm going to be particularly busy until next Tuesday. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how that coincides with all of the Lakers games, but uh, somebody asked me, Kiana in Hawaii, asked me if I was going to be on Twitter and stuff. And sometimes I just might not have the time to do that much between now and next Tuesday. And uh, then we'll just hopefully it'll be a little less busy for me after that. Okay, um, let's discuss some of what was going on before the game. Uh, I'm just going to make this video kind of a hybrid video, kind of between short and long. It's going to be more towards long, though. And I might just be making one video for at least until next Tuesday, and then we'll just see after that. Or maybe it will be just one video if I'm doing it the day after. Uh, there's no reason to make a short video if it's coming the day after. The short videos are intended to come right after the game, uh, just to kind of give people a quick hit on what happened. So might just be doing one video from at least until the the end of this regular season, but we'll see. Like I said, we'll just play it by ear. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about going back before, I guess, actually after the Brooklyn game, going into the Boston game, and then coming into the Utah game, just because there's a couple, of just some random notes that I have that I just wanted to, to touch on quickly. First of all, let me just say, this season, I have not had as much of an opportunity to follow the day-to-day -day interviews and articles as I have had in previous seasons. So there are people in the Jeremy Lin Global family who are on Twitter who are more connected to that. And so I would advise you to pay attention to those people, people like Melody Ting, uh, Nate Gottlieb, Z Zukovka on Twitter. These are people that are probably following what's going on from the reporters and some of the interviews more than I have the opportunity to right now. In previous seasons, I was very good about that. We'll see how that, hopefully I can get back to that a little bit more going forward. But uh, now I am more focused on games than I ha uh, am on some of the other stuff going on. So just to let people know that. 
because uh, again, our our goal is to give people the best information on Jeremy that exists. And so, if we can't get you everything, then we want to tell you who can give it to you and where to get it at. So that's that's a big part of what we want to be able to do. Now, coming back to this pregame stuff, I guess after the Brooklyn game, Jeremy said that because he's been playing more at shooting guard, he was asked, do you have less control over the offense then? And I believe he said that, yes, he does have a little bit less control, meaning he doesn't get to maybe initiate all the sets or he doesn't get to dribble as much as he might want or whatever it is. So I wanted to bring that up. And that comes back into play because, of course, Ronnie Price just got injured or he just is is going to or has had surgery on his elbow, which means it sounds like he's going to be out for the rest of the season. So that means Jeremy will likely be playing more at point guard, which certainly was the case against Utah last night. So we have to see how that affects Jeremy's performance. Um, in Byron Scott's offense, at least from the extent that I can tell of it, I haven't had a chance to break it down completely, but you can see that it's shared between the two guards, meaning between the, the point guard and the shooting guard. So there are times when the point guard will initiate the offense, and there are times when the shooting guard will initiate the offense. Now, within the system, there still might be more of a, of a premium placed on the point guard as compared with the shooting guard in terms of making decisions. But it's more balanced between the two guards than what you will see in a lot of other offenses where the point guard is making the majority of the decisions or initiating the offense, in my opinion. So even if there's, even if Jeremy has a little less freedom, so to speak, as a shooting guard, he still has a decent amount of freedom as compared with how he might have freedom as a shooting guard in another system. There are exceptions to that, of course, like Houston uh, and like the Lakers when Kobe's playing shooting guard and kind of running things. But uh, uh, I guess my point is I don't, it doesn't appear as though it limits Jeremy too much when he's playing shooting guard within Byron Scott's system. That That's kind of what I wanted to say out of all of this, although Jeremy himself apparently feels a little bit, a little bit more hemmed in, a little less in control of the offense, I guess, when he is playing shooting guard. Now, there has been some discussion about is Jeremy playing better because he's playing the shooting guard, because of this coming out and playing with Ronnie as the point and Jeremy as shooting guard. You know, I don't I don't know, honestly. Like I said, I would have to go back over the games and look at that. And I bring this up also because in the um <clears throat> excuse me in the Boston game there was a change made in the in the second half by Byron Scott and I believe he he put Wes Johnson at the power forward spot which is something that Mike D'Antoni liked to do and, and often did and so the team became a little smaller and the floor became more spread out so there was more spaces for Jeremy to drive to the basket. That is, uh, the, the, sp the spacing of the offense was a little bit better. And so I'm discussing all of these things because these are small little intricacies that can translate into bigger effects. And so when we want to break down how did Jeremy play better, we want to look at all of these things because all of them can have a measurable effect, kind of looking at it from a second level of analysis, rather just looking then, okay, well, Jeremy played well or he didn't play well. But 
also in the Boston game. Jeremy was good in the first half and the second half. And so it uh, it wasn't just with Wesley Johnson playing at the power forward. And if you go to Lakers ground, and I know a lot of you do, Dancing Barry, who is the editor-in-chief of, of Lakers ground, I believe, he always does breakdowns of the games afterwards. I think they're very useful. There are some good analytical minds over there, like D- Dancing Barry, like uh, Fiendish Doc, I believe, who's done kind of some of the um, X's and O's breakdowns of the Lakers. And so he mentioned this. He mentioned Wesley out and Wesley uh, Wesley at power forward, Wesley not at power forward. And he made the point, which is correct, which is Jeremy played well either way. The first half, when Wesley was not playing power forward, Jeremy scored 12 points in the second quarter, I believe. And then when Wesley was playing power forward, then Jeremy scored 13 points. In third in the fourth quarter in overtime, so it, it didn't really matter, and that's my own sense of Jeremy playing at point guard or shooting guard. It doesn't really matter. A lot of this comes down to, <clears throat> excuse me, Jeremy Jeremy's ability and the reads that he's making. Now it might be a thing that he's facing a different defender as a point guard and a shooting guard. It might be that he's guarding somebody different as a point guard and a shooting guard. Maybe it's a little easier. But I am of the belief that Jeremy can function well at either position, as point guard or shooting guard. It has more to do with, I think it has more to do with where his mind is at than whether he's playing one of those two positions. I will say that the way the floor is spaced, like having Wesley at power forward, that can make a difference in the way Jeremy will perform because the more the defense has to extend out to the three-point line and guard it, then there is just, there's more space with which to get to the basket. And because Jeremy's game is so heavily tilted towards driving to the basket, then that can make a difference. Although it did not make a difference in the Boston game. He was good in either lineup, in either alignment. So uh, I just want to mention all this because all of this is being discussed. And it's being discussed among fans. And it's being discussed among doubters. Well, he did well because he only played shooting guard. With the the, the thinking that if he had had to play point guard, he wouldn't have done as well. And I don't think that's accurate at all. So I don't want to diminish what Jeremy's done. And uh, that's another part of why I'm, I'm discussing all this. Now, it was also brought up that... <clears throat> James Worthy said before, I think before the Boston game, that Jeremy Lin had his chance to start, so he didn't deserve to start anymore. Do I agree with that? No. But, again, Byron's playing. Byron has this thing, okay, 15 to 20 games, and then I change the lineup. And then, you know, we've talked about this before. I talked about it recently, saying that I believe that Nick Young might become a starter because he is the only active roster member who has not started this year but now I believe Nick is himself injured and so obviously he he cannot start given that circumstance Uh, the Lakers had lost 16 of 17 games going into the Boston contest so they were 1 in 16 then of course was the whole celebration gate I guess you can call it or video bombing gate. We discussed this a lot on Twitter. This was the thing where I guess Kobe said on Jimmy Kimmel, he wasn't thrilled with the celebration after the Boston win. Some people thought Kobe was just joking. I didn't see the clip, so I can't say, but I do know that reporters relayed that they thought Kobe wasn't happy about it. And then coach Scott himself said he felt the same way as Kobe did And he didn't like it. Now, basically what this came down to was Jeremy was the player of the game. 
at least as decided on the Lakers broadcast. And so after the game, Mike Trudell, who is the Lakers sideline reporter for their network, was going to interview Jeremy Lin. And so he went to start interviewing. And then the interview was video bombed, which means interrupted just in a fun way. It's by Nick Young, Jordan Hill, and for a moment, Carlos Boozer. And so Nick Young and Jordan Hill kind of were being silly and just saying whatever. Now, and and so I guess my feeling is that Kobe likely thought it was a little bit out of character or the Lakers don't do this or don't look like you've never won before. Uh, don't be disrespectful and so on. Do I understand that? Yes, I understand that. There's, I, I get it. The Lakers are one of the, the 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 one of the two, maybe the flagship franchise in the NBA. So you don't want to diminish the brand or just don't do things that that don't seem to fit with that image. On the other hand, the team had again won one game out of the past seventeen. There is a feeling among many that the team is purposely tanking, that they're trying to lose. And so that wears on players. I mean, if you're not if you're not putting players in the best situations to win, then that's gonna I mean, guys are competitive and that's gonna bother them. And so it's like I'm not excusing what happened. But I think that if you put guys in situations that are difficult, then silly things can happen, like what happened after the Boston game. Finally, on this this uh, this interview gate or whatever celebration gate, it is becoming more common around the NBA for these types of celebrations and antics to take place. This was very common when LeBron James was a member of the Miami Heat. It was like a running joke where various members of the team would uh, interrupt each other's interviews. And now it's kind of spreading around the NBA, like the Detroit Pistons did it the other day. And so maybe it's, I don't know, maybe Kobe and Byron just don't want the Lakers to be like every other franchise or and be goofy and silly and imitate LeBron or I, I don't know what it is, but I get it. I, I do think too much was made out of it. Look, let the guys have fun. They just won. And not only did they win, they beat the biggest rival of the Lakers. They beat them at home. And they beat them in overtime. It was a difficult game. The Lakers almost blew the game in regulation. So it was an emotional win. I thought the guys were letting off some steam and so on. So that's just my thought on that. I, I, I understand, I understand Kobe and Byron's position, or at least what I think it is. But I, I do think too much was made out of it. I, I just think it's don't don't be a buzzkill on an, an important victory when guys finally feeling good about themselves. I, I, that that's my position. Okay. Um, I also made the note here. It says, "Yeah, Jeremy doesn't like to lose." I, I think some guys dislike losing more than others. Now, we've heard before the Jeremy stuff. He's not competitive enough. Other guys like to lose less or, or more. They, they hate losing more than Jeremy does. I, I think that the losing is really worn on Jeremy. One of the things we know about Jeremy from his past is that he plays best when the games are meaningful. Uh, he plays best when the games are on the line, when there's something to play for. So if there if there isn't anything, then that can one it can hurt his performance, and number two, it it's a it's not a situation that he's used to. And like I said, some guys are cool if they get paid. Give me the check. I'll show up. I'll play. Whatever. But. We've seen in Jeremy's past, particularly in Houston, how much he would internalize the losses, 
how much the losses wore him down and he'd be upset and he'd be blaming himself and so on and so forth. So I think, I think Jeremy's particularly sensitive to losing. He doesn't like it. And so all of this losing, uh, I think has kind of grinded him down a little bit. And, uh, so that's just a, an observation I was thinking of. I think he'll do better on a team that is doing more and having more success in a season than, than in a circumstance like this. But I will say he's done a good job of staying with it and not kind of mailing it in or not trying his hardest. And so that's good. Now, after the Boston game, Byron Scott said that he thought Lynn had a world of confidence and that his offensive aggressiveness was great. Yeah, I agree with that. It was. And he did have a lot of confidence. That was clearly Linsanity level confidence in the Boston game. Jeremy knew he was hot. He felt like he could do anything he wanted to do, and whatever he did was going to work. And that's a really important part of Linsanity. Jeremy is in control, and he knows it. And that's... that is what he wants to achieve. That's that's what he wants to be able to bring nine in and nine out. And we've talked about how that can happen and being able to play in the flow and these types of things to kind of have more of that. And hopefully the right situation will also encourage that, the right situation and the right coach. Okay. Somebody also asked me, Paul, is Jeremy having more success because the Lakers are using more pick and rolls? And this goes back to what we we're discussing earlier. Is this kind of a, is there something new going on here? Does Jeremy need to play shooting guard? Does he need to have Wesley play at the power forward? Is this, is there some secret that's come out now? I, again, without having looked at it more, without having really broken down the tape and saying, okay, they're playing, 60% pick and rolls now versus 40% earlier. I I don't think that's what it is. Now, in the offense, in Byron Scott's system, the player can decide to call for a pick and roll, I believe. I think it is up to the guards or the people handling the ball where they can they can ask for a pick and roll. It, it, that's their choice. And so Jeremy might be asking for more pick and rolls. He might be looking for more pick and rolls than he may have been earlier in the season. If that's the case, then is that helping him? Yeah, probably is because Jeremy's a, at his core is a pick and roll player. Uh, is there anything happening more in the offense? I, maybe. I don't know. I, I, like I said, I haven't studied it enough to really know if Byron Scott is calling more for pick-and-roll plays. Uh, I just have to look at it. It wouldn't surprise me if it's a bit more, but I don't think it's like an overwhelming amount more than what was going on earlier. Again, I think this has more to do with Jeremy and Jeremy's development than it has to do with certain schemes and, and so on or what position he's playing. Okay, um, finally, before the final pregame thing I want to discuss, and this is going around today, so uh, this isn't really necessarily before the uh, the Utah game, but there's this article out on ESPN, I believe, saying that Byron Scott doesn't believe in analytics. Now, if you're not familiar with what that means or if you're newer to the NBA, in the past I, five to ten years, maybe five years more, uh, five years is closer to it rather than ten, there's been a new statistical revolution in the NBA. What are the best spots on the court to take shots? What what offense works best? This is kind of like Houston and Daryl Morey. Daryl Morey is like king of analytics. It's the theory, you know, like something like, well, it's layups and three-pointers are what you should take. Don't take inefficient middle range jump shots this type of thing so these are 
truisms or theories that are coming out of the analytics revolution. And apparently in this article by ESPN, it was reported that Byron Scott is not, uh, uh, he doesn't believe in analytics or he doesn't use the information from analytics much. I think for a lot of people, they'll say, well, yeah, that's not a real surprise. Byron Scott stuff's like from the 1980s, his offense. So it isn't, it, it isn't a shock that Byron feels this way. There are others who feel the way that he does as well, kind of the old school coaches, eye test coaches. Uh, I just believe what I see. I don't need numbers to tell me anything. Uh, again, it's – how does that affect Jeremy? Um, well, I, I think Byron's – I think some of what he does is outdated. Uh, I think Jeremy would be best served playing for a coach who is in step with the analytics movement. Um, on the other hand, look, Jeremy played in Houston, and he did like the system, but he didn't like his role in the system. So even if he played for an analytics-oriented organization, that doesn't mean that he's going to be used properly. But it is something that's out there. We have touched on this. Byron Scott is a dinosaur age coach. Uh, he's in the dinosaur era. So I just wanted to kind of report on that uh, as well. Now let's get to the game itself. As I mentioned, what happened, the Lakers came back. They put on the fourth quarter charge. were able to get the win. It was, it was good. Quick statistics. Jordan Clarkson had a career-high 22 points, four rebounds, three assists. Wayne Ellington, 15 points, 10 rebounds, which was a career-high rebounds for him. I think it was the first time he ever had a double-double as a player, meaning 10 or more in two different categories like points and rebounds. Carlos Boozer, who started 14.6 rebounds. Jordan Hill off the bench with 16 points. Ed Davis, 12 points, 9 rebounds. Jeremy Lin, 8 points in 24 minutes, 3 of 12 shooting from the field, 0 of 4 from 3-point range, 2 of 2 free throws, 2 rebounds, 3 assists, 1 steal, 1 block, 0 turnovers, and his plus-minus was a plus 5 for the Losing Jazz, Gordon Hayward, 20 points. Rudy Gobert, 16 points, four, 14 rebounds. Derek Favors, 18 points, 9 rebounds. And Elijah Millsap off the bench with 17 points and 7 rebounds. Uh, Jeremy overall here. I thought that Jeremy tried to do a little bit too much in this game until the fourth quarter. And in the fourth quarter, I thought he played quite well. Uh, I'm not going to do the the entire quarter-by-quarter breakdown right now. I just want to keep this a little bit shorter. But that was my overall impression of Jeremy in this game. A little too much dribbling at times. And his shot was off. Uh, Going against Rudy Gobert is difficult. Rudy Gobert has an incredibly long arm length, uh, wingspan. So he's a shot blocker. And Utah played good defense in this game. They were good around the rim in terms of defending against layups and such. Jeremy's shot was off. This is what I said. So so we can't get too high or too low because there's going to be nights like this. And he's still developing. I... I just thought that he forced things a little too much for the the first three quarters of this game. As I said, maybe dribbling too long in a possession, maybe trying to force a shot that wasn't there. And again, is this because he was playing point guard? Uh, And he he did play point guard in this game, a good amount, and he also played shooting guard some with Jordan Clarkson in the game. So I'm not sure. I Again, I'm not going to break it down too micro here, but that's what I thought. And and I this is a normal pattern. Like I said, you can't you go up the progress curve and you come down a little bit and you go up some more. Um, 
What was good, though, was that Jeremy was better in the fourth quarter. He, he picked up his intensity and his focus, and he was making positive plays at that point, which was very good to see and which, again, fits his profile as Mr. Fourth Quarter and as a clutch player. And he had no turnovers. So those are the two takeaways. I would – I would the, the two – Negative, I guess, takeaways you could say is he didn't shoot well and he might have forced a little bit too much. But shooting comes and goes, and he'll continue to get better at that over time. Uh, that's that's nothing. That, that's, that just happens. The forcing, well, keep working at it. As we said, try to get to that formula of letting the game come to you. If there's a situation or an opponent or your shot's not falling on a certain night, then just distribute the ball a little bit more. To Jeremy's credit, he did have three assists, and he had zero turnovers. So the positives are no turnovers, and he played well in the fourth quarter. And this is what I try to say to fans. Don't – you can't just judge Jeremy on statistics, on did he have a Linsanity level game. Did he have 20 points? Did he have 10 assists? Did he have whatever? We don't want to make the, the expectations too high. Uh, a lot of it is he's not going to be put in situations all the time like he was in New York. So you can't score 20 points if you only get five shots. Now, of course, tonight he had 12 shots, but that's you have to know the situation. And you can't expect a high level of performance in in every situation is not going to be the situation that Jeremy had when he was a member of the Knicks. Meaning the teammates are not going to be the same. The system is not going to be the same. Jeremy's shooting might not be effective on a particular night. And so I think it's it's good to let him let him develop uh let him develop i'm not discouraged by this performance at all i expected something like this to happen whether it was in this game or sometime soon again the shot will be there it'll be on and off at times as he keeps working on it and i don't care how good of a shooter you are some nights you just don't shoot well or the defense might be really good and I think there was a combination of those two things tonight. I thought Utah's defense against Jeremy was pretty darn good. And the shot was off. Uh, in terms of the thing that that I was most focused on in this game as regards to Jeremy is what decisions was he making? Was he dribbling a little too much? Was he looking to pass a little bit more, et cetera? That's the area I would focus on. I thought Jeremy could have been a little bit better on that tonight. and uh, But that's it. You, you expect that. As Kobe talked about, Jeremy's got to go through it for himself, figure it out, come to make, come to find the right balance between shooting and passing, having the, the shooting guard instincts, versus the point guard instincts, shooting versus passing in that in that comparison. And that's what tonight was. So tonight wasn't his best night, but he contributed to the team. He didn't turn the ball over at all, and the team won. And because I'm happy for Jordan. Jordan played pretty darn well in this game, and the team got its second victory in a row. So, again, but I was say to Jeremy's fans, just be content or don't get down when Jeremy doesn't have a super game every single night because he's no player does. And Jeremy as a player himself is not at that level yet where he's, he's got to build up to that. The, the goal for him now is to become more consistent and then the consistency level, the level of, of, that he plays at consistently, that can rise. So 
okay, you're consistently scoring 10 points a game. Maybe you can get it up to 13 points a game. And, and that's about, that's that's what I saw. I saw this game as just, it's another game in a long season. He's had better games, but he did some good things, and the team won. So, good. And so, let's, let's move on to the next game. And, uh, you know, we'll see from there. I will say there probably will be some people who will bring up the Jeremy at home versus Jeremy on the road. Okay, Jeremy didn't play well, and this was a road game, you know, that that type of thing. Uh, but uh, as I've said before, I don't put a lot of stock into that. Uh, I think Jeremy can play well anywhere. Maybe there's a slight thing there. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't. Uh, maybe so. Maybe uh, it, it's possible. And look, if, if that's the case, well, then again, the more the more regularly and more he plays, and the more opportunities he gets, then that'll get less and less. That's a typical thing for younger players and more inexperienced players is that they will play better at home than on the road. So if there's something to that, that's not it's not unique to Jeremy. So, uh, uh, that's, that's how I feel about that. Okay. The next game is coming up tomorrow, Friday, February 27th, and it will take place against the Milwaukee Bucks. And it will be in Los Angeles, California at Staples Center. And it will take place at 10 30 PM Eastern time in the United States. So that means 7 30 PM Pacific time. And it means the game will take place on Saturday, February 28th at 11.30 a.m. in China, in Taiwan, and in the Philippines. Milwaukee is, they just made some trades. They're a pretty good team. They're, I have to think about where they're at right now after the trades, but they're a decent team. They're, they're not a pushover team. They're, they're relatively deep. I, they like to get up and down the court. They play good defense, so that could be that could be a little bit challenging for Jeremy in terms of getting to the basket. Um, look, like I said, I'm hoping for Jeremy for a better performance than, than than this game against Utah, but he still did okay in that. He still did all right in that. But uh, just try to build on what has been a nice three- to four-game stretch for Jeremy. And let's just move forward from that. He will be, I'm sure, getting plenty of playing time, including at point guard with Ronnie Price out. So let's see. Let's see what happens tomorrow night against the Milwaukee Bucks. Okay, that is it for now. Um, Thumbs up, thumbs down, your comments below. Thank Gary Chen for the artwork you're looking at right now. Gary is a blogger and artist in Taiwan. He's a member of the Jeremy Only Lynn Garden Fan Club. We appreciate his letting us use his work. Uh, Also, information in the video description, how you can follow us on Twitter, and how you can come and join the Conservative New Media Facebook group. Once again, I am PFE Paul F. for the Rio, the NBA expert. Thanks a lot for watching Conservative New Media. We strive to be the number one Jeremy Lin YouTube fan channel. So, as I said, might have to make some switches to the videos. Uh... I'm going to be busy through probably next Tuesday. Again, another a successful outing for the Lakers. It's been a while since they've won two games in a row. Jeremy helped the cause, particularly in the fourth quarter. In my opinion, he had a little bit of dip in the performance, which is to be expected. Not every game is going to be like Boston. and But I think it's normal, and I'm looking for – a, a a positive outing in the Milwaukee game coming up tomorrow. That is it for now. Hope you're having a great night, a great day, wherever you are around the world when you watch this video. Take care, and we will talk to you again soon.